Hello everyone and welcome to Reignite. Thank you for stopping by. Okay, there is going to be no waffle from me today because the guest we have is so busy that if I sit here talking, he might book another gig and bugger off. So let's jump straight in. Let's welcome singer, songwriter, bassist, author, actor, and of course, former Sex Pistol, Mr. Glenn Matlock. Hey. Hello, Kathy. How are you doing? All right. Hello, Glenn. How you doing? I've only acted in one thing. I know. Well, I was going to come to that later and ask if you had any more plans, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just saying how, um, I don't know if you heard that, I'm worried that you were going to bugger off and go to another gig if I took too long introducing you. Are you packed and ready? Because you're off with Blondie in what, two weeks? Less than two weeks now. I'm flying out in <laughs> Australia and then. Um... And I'm there for about two weeks, and then I go to America with them. And I'm there for a little, do a couple of things, and I'm going to do some shows also at the end of that with my American band, with Ken Burke and Gilby Clark. We got a few things in California, and then I come back and I've got a couple of things on, which I'm going to keep a secret for now. And then we got oh. some more, we got some more Blondie stuff. So um, yeah, busy boy. When you say you're going to keep a secret for now, can we pry it out of you before the oh. end of the show or not? <laughs> oh. <Right. laughs> I've just seen, thank you to everyone for, for turning up. I've just seen somebody from Dublin, somebody from Sweden and somebody from the US all pop up in the first couple of minutes. So thank you all for coming. Right. Welcome along. Well, so well, um, as, we're, we're well, international, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> so with your that's what i was going to ask you with you going off again to australia very very soon with blondie are you yeah. um an organized packer or a last minute packer i need to get it down to as least as possible you get enough undercrackers for the time that you're there you have to suss out whether the hotel might have a a um well in fact the first thing you've got to suss out whether the hotel might have a washing machine that you can use then that mm -hmm. makes all the different there's a quite a nice hotel i stay in in west hollywood sometimes and they got a little self-service thing washers and dryers and then you've only got like five days worth and then you can rotate it take a bigger bag and you might find that nice shirt with a pocket in that is hard to come by down on melrose and then you can bring back some stuff that you can only get there and not here so you know but yeah i used to take loads and loads and loads but now i yeah. take possible and then you get out the airport quicker as well yeah so, that's what i like i like to get, go carry on only and then you just grab it from the overhead and you just shoot off and you get in the cabs while everyone's still waiting for their tack their uh, bags to come out <laughs> exactly you know and i'm also yeah. into economy in of movement when i go to my local coffee shop in the morning i always make them put the sugar in before the milk when i pile the milk in it stirs it you don't have to stir it you see Little things like that all add up for the course of your life. Yeah. I like that one. That's a good one. I've not come across that before. So you get handy hints here. <laughs> but you're, you're a lot classier than me. You see, I always look at not taking too much luggage. But then what I do is when I get in the shower, I take my socks and everything in the shower and stamp on them like they're grapes while I'm oh. having a shower. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, you can wrap them and let them dry out, you know. Yeah, just hang them over the towel rail. I'm such a classy bird. <laughs> and that was the other thing I was going to say, because you do so much travelling and you're here, there and everywhere. Let's say you're Australia, then you're the US and you're back here. What do you do on long flights? How do you kill all that time? Um, do you know what? I, because I've been so busy, I just take the veg out. I don't even watch a movie or anything. No. I, the thing I do watch is map, <laughs> right? I have, yeah. I have a joke yeah. with my baby friend. You just put map on, and then you kind of feel you're in control of your own destiny. After the meal, I kind of wait until somebody in front puts their seat back a little bit, and they're, they're normally watching some movie, and through the gap between the seat, you can see whether it's worthwhile watching it yourself or not. And invariably, <laughs> You know, Rocket Man, the, the, the Freddie Mercury thing. Oh, it looks like trite. You know, don't watch it. But occasionally, there's one or two things, but then by the time you get there, you forget and you think, oh, what was that? And you, 
not been very good anyway, so you don't really waste any time watching it. <laughs> you know what? You got a good idea because you know you channel hop at home. You could channel hop between the first three seats in front. It's like, what are you watching? What are you watching? What are you watching? No, That's I'm a good idea. That, in that way, relaxing, you can actually yeah. go like that as well. <laughs> So you got this down to you got it down to a fine art. <laughs> I don't know if you got it up in Lincolnshire, but um, I kind of watch it live in the afternoon sometimes, and they have these really mm -hmm. old black and white movies on. Um, in fact, there was one a couple of years back. It's fantastic. I wish they had these on planes, and it was called Paul of London, and it was about a tramp steamer i don't know if you know what a tramp steamer is it's like a kind of a almost private cargo ship that would go to one okay. place and pick some stuff up and then take that to somewhere else and take all that and it was all to do with them coming to the pool of london which is where the docks used to be and hmm. because kind of near hatton garden they had the cunning ruse to pull off a diamond heist now of course there's a caribbean bloke on it is the immediate suspect and he didn't do it at all but who is in it, and it was made in like 1949 or something, and it's one of my neighbours, or was until kind of recently, was um, Leslie Phillips, who's about 17 years old. That, in this movie, oh, maybe 19. But I like movies like that, you know, and you see yeah. sort of big, big stuff. I'm a big fan of a movie called The Blue Lamp with Dirk Bogard, and it was all filmed around my, yeah. my area before they built the Westway. And then I saw a great movie the other night called West Eleven, which was all set around Portobello Roadway. It's kind of cool. I like things like that. Yeah, they don't. I was just thinking, yeah, because on planes, they should have a channel that's all the old movies, all the old black and white movies, shouldn't yeah. they? And they don't do that. Do you know? I'm going to write in. When I, go I think football, you should. When I go to football with my son and it comes to our attention that, the left winger isn't doing what a left winger should do. We decide that we should actually write in. Now, who you write into, we haven't kind of achieved that yet. But you know, in principle, if you write in, now somebody will sort it out for you. That's what I like. Yeah, you to never do. know. Yeah. yeah. How are QPR doing at the moment? She asks well, as a gooner. Well, we've got a new manager, and we've ridden, risen to the giddy heights of about sixteenth in uh, the championship, whereas we. I think we're safe this year, and I think next year we're going to be contenders. We've got a good top side now, and I'm going to go. Yeah. First, I'm going to say first game this year tomorrow with my son. I can't remember who we're playing. Don't know. But what I like doing when I go down football is you get a tap on the shoulder, and some bloke comes up to you, and you go, "Do you remember me?" And you think, "Oh no, I'm in trouble for something." And it's somebody I, maybe I used to go to infant school with or something like that. So that's kind of cool. Oh, that's oh. good. And what what would you recommend? Because I've often seen you and I've been uh, looking at your Instagram. What would you recommend as the best half time pie or pasty? Well, it's it's got to be a, a pucker chicken balti pie. But the only thing is, Queens Park Rangers fortunes went down the last couple of seasons, and I I used to have a season ticket, and I gave up on that because I'm not always around, you know. And then when you are around, they're playing away or something like that. Yeah. But, I used to get a chicken, a pucker pie, chicken balti pie, and um, just for a laugh, put it up. And we started winning, right? And it was my lucky totem, and I would eat it whether I needed one or not. You know, and people from all around uh... the world, you know, there's Queen's Park Rangers fans all around the world. Even Steve Jones would write, you, I put the pie up, and he'd go, oh, you're down, down off this road. And, uh, and then they changed the brand, and our results started going down. It was all down to the pies. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> oh, by the way, before we carry on, I meant to say, fantastic show. We saw you um, Nottingham Rock City the other week when you were on the SLF tour. Amazing. Right. Really, really brilliant show. Really enjoyed your set. Thank you. More where that came from. We'll be out again later on in the year. That's a great... Yeah, it's a great old venue, that Nottingham Rock City. Been going there since back in the 80s, and it's just a proper, proper venue. That I, I love the atmosphere in there. It is. Um, and what else? Something else happened. Oh, yeah. It's the next morning. We had to drive on somewhere else, and we wasn't in a mad rush. And around the corner from the hotel we were staying at, near the castle, there's a, um, there's like a Robin Hood shop. 
<laughs> hidden window. It's got this hey? sort of display. Yeah, it sells like stuff, you know, like those hats with feathers in and all that. <laughs> and it, it, it had like a bamboo arrow with some feathers on it stuck in the thing. And it said, Robin and the last arrow. And I thought, yeah, bet it ain't. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <Mate>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, listen. I was going to say, but we need to find out for people that are watching while we're gassing away about this, that, and the other. We need to find out for people who don't know who is Glenn Matlock and where did he come from. So we're going to go all the way back in time, right back to the beginning. And you are still living in the same area that you were born in, you were telling me before we came on there. You're still in Paddington, yeah? Yeah. Well, actually, I was born in Paddington and I was brought up in a place called Cancel Drain up the Arrow Road, which has got a whole load of, not a lot there, but it's all right. And then I ended up, yeah, I only ended up here by sort of chance, really, but it's, it's handy, you know, there's kind of, a good selection of musicians around here and coffee shops and the streets are wide and it's got a bit of history around here and made of our studios is just around the corner and mm. you can walk to the west end in half an hour so through it's not bad, is it? yeah it's all right i quite like it and i think always think of living somewhere else and you know unless you move to the middle of belgravia or somewhere which a bit too much traffic then. it's all right you know. oh, yeah yeah and then so so you've been roughly so you're roughly what within a couple of miles of where you were brought up so how right back then what what started you with music i know you used to like listen to radio luxembourg i've heard you say it's so i've told the story a few times but when i was about five or six or something like that my uncle i suppose he, he was only about 10 years older than me but maybe a little bit more my mum just younger brother um he gave me these 78s and we had a big old radiogram and the first records i actually put on were like bill ailey and jerry lee lewis and lord rockingham's 11 elvis on this big old radiogram and it was like you know on when you light a firework it says like blue touch paper and retire immediately yeah. It was like that. You put this thing on, and 78 goes round so fast, and they're, they're heavy bits of shellac, you know, which you've got to be careful yeah. with. They but you think they was going to fly off and take your head off, so you put a record on and then go and stand at the other side of the room. <laughs> you know, listen to stuff like that. So the first records I put on were pretty rocking records. And then, very early 60s, you know, Christmas, all the kids got little tiny transistor radios, as I did as well. And you tune into that because we didn't have a national ra music radio station. The only place you could listen to music in England at the time was Brian Matthews' show on a Saturday morning who played clips from comedy shows like Hancock's Half Hour and The Navy Laugh interspersed with a Dave Clark Five or The Beatles just coming out or something like that. Or Jimmy Savile's show, um, you know, the... Set da, 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 you know, the top 40. And I always thought it's a bit yeah. daft. I don't know what the top 40 is if you've never heard all the other records. You know, it was kind of weird. And then, you know, with these transistor radios, you started getting hip to Radio Luxembourg and American Forces Network. And then Pirate Radio Station started up. You know, and that's when bands yeah. like The Kinks and The Who and The Arbors and The Stones came through. And then on the back of that, there was... um tv show called ready steady go which yeah. uh, had all those bands playing live on and then plus dusty springfield was on it quite a lot Ooh. she was almost like a co-presenter and she got hip to this tour that was going on which wasn't doing very well and insisted that they had the artist on the tv and it was the town of motown tour so then you had like Smokey robinson and martha oh. Reeves and vandellas and all you know all those kind of people it was it was best nice. tv Really, you know. No. Sadly, they didn't keep a lot of the tapes. They used to tape over them. There's a few. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a few um, things going around, but they haven't got all of them. But, you know, it, maybe about 10 years, a bit more ago, now I got to play with my all time favourite band, The Faces, because I became mates with Ian McGlagan, who was the keyboard player in The Small Faces and The Faces, and he did some work with my band, The Richie. But his yeah. ex his ex-missus was there 
who was the main dancer on Ready Steady Go, Sandy Sandy Sargent, right? If you see oh, any wow. body girl, you know, giving it that all and probably speeding yeah. out. She was there. Anyway, I was chatting to her. She's from Council Green. She she used to go to my school. <laughs> no. I, yeah. So so maybe Council Green wasn't such um a daft thing anyway. And in fact, when I met Ian McGagan, I said, I saw you once. He said, Well, I've been on the telly and all that. I said, No, no. I said, when we was kids, we all went round to see you taking out the girl from Ready Steady Go. <laughs> I went round with my bicycle. He said, Well, you didn't have a lot to do. I said, mate, it was cancel growing when I was 10. Uh, you know, right. He said, anyway, he said, I didn't just take her. I used to live there with her mum and you know, her and her mum. And I used to drink in a Mason's arms up the Arrow Road. I said, Well, that's where I had my first pint, you know. So it's all these kind of things kind of dovetail. Yeah. Kind yeah, yeah, yeah. How weird. How weird. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't have much to watch on telly, did we? We didn't have any channels. And nowadays you don't go out because there's thousands of things on. But you used to find your own entertainment back in those days. You talking about listening to music and how we didn't have radio stations. I don't know if you remember, you used to go down the phone box, put 10p in. I think it was... Is it dial one six zero dial a disc, and you'd stand in the phone box listening to like the song of the week. Yeah, yeah. Really. <laughs> I feel like Monty Python. You tell the kids that today, they won't believe you. Rogers. <laughs> the other thing we had was the talking clock. Right, dial one two yeah. three. Now, in my, I'm, I better be able these days, but in the early eighties, it was I was a bit of a boozer, and you get up, and he had no idea what time it was, and you'd reach over. <laughs> And dial one, two, three to find out whether you had time to get to the pub for last orders at lunchtime or <laughs> have a bit more of a kip and get there for first orders, you know, at five o'clock or five thirty. Yeah. So you should get, <laughs> and then one day the, the voice answered, it was this woman's voice, right? And, she, and today the time sponsored by Actress is, you know, 1 45 pm. But do you know what? The voice. It was my mother-in-law. Shut right. up. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was my mother-in-law, Gloria. And um, <laughs> I had to call her up. I said, no. she, said uh, she said, yeah. <laughs> so she no. Was, um, you know, when you got a bit of a stonking hangover, it was like, no, nah, no, nah, somebody's winding me up. <laughs> That's bizarre. <laughs> So, as we were going off track again. So, I was going to ask you was when you first started playing, yeah. did you start with bass? Did you start with guitar? And did you complete? Are you self taught? Self taught. I had a guitar one for Christmas when I was about 10. Uh, in fact, the guitar I had, I don't know how I ended up there, but the guitar I had, if you go to the Hard Rock in London in Piccadilly, there's the Hard yeah. Rock Burger Place and opposite. On the next corner in an old bank building is their kind of merch shop. And downstairs, uh -huh. there's a vault. And they've got Les Paul's number two Les Paul. they got um, Jimi Hendrix's Flying V, John Entwistle's bass, da, 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 all this stuff, all arranged around a safe that looks like it's had the door blown off. And in the safe is the guitar that my mum and dad bought me, this little rock and old acoustic guitar. Don't know how they got it, but they got it. Oh, and my God. Got... Yeah, check it out. And I was talking to the girl there, and she says, all these kids come in, and, you know, they kind of like what's here, but they like the guitar best because it's the thing that they can most relate to, you know, because they yeah. probably called, well, they don't know who Jimi Hendrix was, you know, too young. Ah, now I can tell you a Jimi Hendrix, do you want to hear a Jimi Hendrix story from, from Lincolnshire? Yeah, go on. He played um, the first, what's recognised as being the first ever festival here in Spalding in Lincolnshire, where we live. And it was with uh, Cream and Pink Floyd, Pink oh. Floyd in 1967. And it's named now as the first ever music festival in our little town in Spalding. There's a blue plaque up on the pub in, uh, in town. What's it, what was the festival called? Was it something? Oh, small? God. Uh, did it have a name? Ash, I'm looking across at Ash, my producer. Tulip it might have been the Tulip Festival. Could be, because we're known for our tulips here. Oh, yeah? So it could be that. 
We're known as the South Holland district. We grow tulips for all over the country in Lincolnshire. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was recognised as the first ever music festival. Right, right, okay, yeah? but that's fair enough, and I'm taking that on board. But I'm, let's go back to the tulips, right? Yes. Do your, do your tulips? Do they flop <laughs> after a couple of days in the in the thing? Of the they do that? flop. Yeah, they get a droop. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's an international thing. I just do. think they're happier. They're happier being left outside. As soon as you bring them inside, they're not happy. So I'll leave them outside. But we yeah. do have, we do have some beautiful, beautiful tulips here. And we have a flower festival coming up in May where they go through the streets on a float and parade about. So we're looking forward to that. We're going to be we're going to be road marshals for it. You know, right. No, you can't come down here. That sort of thing. Um, but getting back to you. <laughs> And your <laughs> early years. <laughs> I'm going to tell you another little hour road story, right? Go do, up, please up, do. Up, to do with flowers. Up the hour yes. road towards Holsden, right? Mm -hmm. up, but just past, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, I'll come to that anyway. Just past where in latter days they had the four horsemen of the apocalypse day nursery. <laughs> just past. What? <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> a college park, just past there, there was a flower shop. And when I was at school, and I was at 14 or 15, I was mates with this girl, and it's Valentine's Day. And I went in there to get a bunch of daffs or something like that. And I'm looking around, and I didn't hardly had any money. And the price of the flowers, even back then, seemed like a lot. Like, Ooh. I'm not kidding you. I'm just looking, and a little bit awkward. This big West Indian lady came in, and she went, me want to return these flowers. The woman said, well, 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 good afternoon, madam. Why is that? Let me, let me look at them. She said, they're blighted, right? And the woman looked at the flowers, looked them over, and she said, well, I'm sorry, you know, they, they, it was a delivery that was ordered, and I've looked at the flowers, and they seem perfectly fine to me. You know, I can't see that they're blighted at all. She said, no. It's not the flowers that's blighted. It's me love that's blighted. We want to return. <laughs> right. And I use that quite as an opportunity to kind of sneak out and not have to spend, you know, burn sex on the bunch of that. <laughs> oh, shouldn't be laughing at such tragedy. <laughs> anyway, enough of the flowers. Anyway. <laughs> enough of the flowers enough of the flowers back to art so <laughs> you studied at st martin school of art yeah. are you still into your art i mean i see your lovely framed pictures behind you on the wall but are you someone who goes off to exhibitions and so forth every now and then um i haven't been for a little bit um i do get to go to some nice galleries around the world I, in london i just tend to flop out quite a bit i've been just so tired from traveling of, of late but you know if you're in chicago or you know or in los angeles or even sydney where i'm going in fact i went there oh, not long before lo lockdown i was doing something over there and there's a big modern art museum up by the rocks and the rocks is the oldest part of sydney on the harbor and mm -hmm. there's a big museum there and i thought i'd pop in there and there's the most fantastic um grace and parry exhibition on of all his tapestry. I don't know if you ever, I didn't know he made tapestries, but they're massive, like 12. No, feet. I didn't. And they, he did this whole series that was a take on um, the Rake's Progress, but updated to the 90s. Um, the Rake's Progress by Hogarth. Um, uh -huh. And they were, they were fantastic. And the world turns full circle because I went to St. Martins and I've always gone on about it, and they get a lot of money from international students year before last i got awarded a um an honorary fellowship from grace and perry at the royal festival hall so i'm quite chuffed about that he actually, he gave you the award yeah well he was very he, cool he was he's 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 moved on now but he he was the um sort of the principal of the university of the arts of london so um yeah he's, he's kind of cool bloke I did actually meet him for a mutual friend in Paris. There's a, a thing like Freeze, you've probably heard of uh, in London, but there's one called Fanac. And um, right. 
I went to the opening day a few years back and I got introduced to him and he was sitting around, you know, waiting for people to come up and sweet talk his picture. And I said, can I have a picture? And he said, yeah. And he had some of his tapestries up there. And I think I got on with him because he said, which one should we do it in front of? And I said, well, the black and white one. And he said, well, don't you like the colour one? I said, no, Grayson. I said, the colour one's fine. I said, but if you do it in black and white one, it'll show off your blue frock nicer. And he went, all right. <laughs> And we got Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> so have you ever actually dabbled yourself though i mean because we had um who did we have on uh billy morrison we had on and he's uh, he does a hell of a lot of exhibitions and artwork are you somebody no. who likes to paint I, I, or draw I, I, or i've let it slip i keep thinking of doing it a couple of times over the years i picked up a pencil and it's a bit like playing the guitar already you've got to keep it up constantly and Although I can draw a bit, it, what you want to draw and the way it comes out, it, I've sort of disappointed myself. So I've got to get back to it. Um, but I will do. Maybe not, just not yet. I'm one yeah, of these people. Busy. You know, yeah, some people think about things. I'm constantly thinking about thinking about things. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. I know, get you. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it. But, you know, if I do go to a gallery, I, 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 th I think I've learned enough over the years to know exactly what's wrong with everybody else's efforts. So. Oh, fair enough. Right. OK, no, I'm, I'm chair critic. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> See, I'm like that when I watch darts. I love watching darts. Can't hit a board for anything. You know, I'll hit the wall, but I'll sit there and tell everyone else what they're doing wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> yeah that's an art. You know, I Put a lot of effort into that, really. You know, no, no, you're doing it wrong. What you want to do? Is... <laughs> <laughs> you're so helpful. <laughs> so going back to you again and your early years, yeah. you um, you worked obviously on the King's Road. Was it just yeah. Malcolm's shop you worked in, or did you work in any other stores no, down there? Malcolm's shop, but it went through a couple of different changes while I was there. It started off as a teddy boy shop called let it rock then it became sex i helped, helped make the sign for it a big pink sort of rauschenberg kind Did of you? Stuff, I think. but i'm going to let you into a little trade secret the x wasn't as padded as it should have been because we run out of foam right oh. and we had to eke it out by the time we got there so that and then it became <laughs> you know and that's where i met stephen paul and rotten and bernard road and a whole bunch of people and it was kind of, in retrospect, I didn't know at the time, but it, in retrospect, it was probably the hippest place to be on a Saturday afternoon in London. And it, yeah. It didn't pay that bad either, you know, and it was a real, getting a job there was a real sliding doors moment in my life. It wasn't, it was a bit of luck involved, but there was also an opportunity that I kind of, just by a gut kind of feeling, I, I, um, I grabbed yeah yeah I mean, but I mean, yeah king king's road at that time i mean the people that must have been hanging out down there would have been phenomenal oh yeah it was it was a lot more well hang on having said that i don't really go down there that much these days but um it, it's just like another high street but then it, yeah. it was kind of cool you know and there was granny takes a trip and you know the rolling stones and people like that would get their clothes from there and then there'd be be um who's the bloke from roxy music uh singer what uh, brian ferry yeah brian, he swanning up and down the road with anthony price and then you know around the corner there'd be well down the road before it became a movie there was the king's road theater and the rocky horror show was in and those people used to come in this in the store you know richard o'brien and little nell and there oh, was wow. like, different a bloke called Piggy, he was a famous model, male model in the early 70s, and Mike, Michael Roberts, who was the the um, fashion editor for the T Sunday Times supplement. It was all these people, you know, and I was like 16 and a half, 17. It was, in, it was interesting. I yeah. even sold her shoes to Mick Ronson once he came in. Yeah. I saw you talk about this on another podcast. Do, do please tell the story of Mick Ronson. Yeah. I love this. I was working there in a the week one day and the door opened and he came in with Ian Hunter and um, and this woman who's Susie Ronson 
who has become mates over the years, um, she was on that Lust for Life to talk and she's got a book out because she was the one who helped Bowie come up with a Ziggy Stardust haircut. Um, and anyway, they ended up getting married. But if Mick had seen his pair of pink leather loafers in the window and he wanted a pair, but it turns out he had really small feet, like six and a half. I had to get all the blinking boxes down, found him a pair, wrapping them up, and I heard a noise behind me. And I thought, what's that? I looked round. He's up the ladder. I said, well, you've been up the ladder. And he said, well, you must be really annoyed with me getting all these boxes down. I'm putting them back for you. I said, you can't do that. You're Mick Runs. And he said, no, no, it's all right. And then he did the, ro they did the Rolling Thunder tour um, with Bob Dylan. I mean, later on. And a movie came out called Ronaldo and Clara, which is kind of loosely based on the Rolling Thunder tour. And it's a bit arty. And in it, Bob Dylan plays Ronaldo. And Joan Baez plays Clara. And Ronnie Blakely plays... Joan Baez, and I think Ronnie Hawkins plays Bob Dylan. It's like kind of nonsense, right? It's four oh hours, God. and in it, Mick, I've worked with Mick Branson after that. He produced The Rich Kids, and um, he said, oh, he said, oh, there's this movie coming out. I'm in it. I play a security guard. I said, oh, all right. Anyway, I saw the movie, and um, there's a bit in it where Bob Dylan, who's supposed to be Ronaldo, and Joan Baez, who's supposed to be Clara, are in this alleyway trying to get back to stage to see the pretend Bob Dylan. And and there's, there's a, and he's, he's not letting them in, he's the security guard. And he's going, No, you're not coming through. He's going, You, you know, in his whole accent, and they're all Americans, go, You, here, here, pop off, pop off. And they're still trying to get through, and he puts his feet up to stop him going. And he's got the pink leather loafers on that I sold him. So, of course, I told everybody in Odium, Camden Town, I sold him. Then they all go, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so, you, are, you have some great, you have some great stories from those days. I heard you also, you were, um, there was a podcast I saw you did in L.A., and you were saying how when you re were recording Nevermind the Bollocks that there was a Womble in the studio and you were trying to explain to those guys what a Womble was. Now, to us, we all remember the Wombles, but to an American, it's got to sound really bizarre. Yeah, Chris Fedding, who's the lead guitarist in the Wombles, yeah. yeah. But you think, you think about it with the Wombles, they were ahead of their time, weren't they? You see, everybody now being green and upcycling and all that, what were they yeah. doing? Going around, finding things and making use of them. I was making, doing, mending. That, that was it, yeah. yeah. That's it. See, that's been going on for a long time. All these people now, they think it's a new, hip, trendy thing to be green. They well, were we're, way ahead of their time. Well, we always used to do that. Put the milk bottles out, take your Corona bottles back, and get, a, get a tanner. Get five. Yeah, used to get 5p back. Oh, I think we got a tanner, which is two and a half pence. Yeah, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, see, it was going on a long, long, long time ago. So thinking about career-wise, before we go off track again, um, I don't want to talk too much about the pistols because I want to get on to what you're doing now because that's what I'm interested in. But we have to, obviously, we're going to mention them, obviously, if that's all right. You just did. <laughs> um, I did, didn't I? Yeah, I should have asked first. Um, one question that came up when I've been talking to people about you coming on was what bands influenced the sound? On never mind the bollocks. Oh, um, well, that, uh, uh, nobody and everybody, everybody in the band like different things. Mm. Um, and you know, I like all the 60s kind of stuff, and I like the Stogies and a bit of the New York Dolls. And me, Stephen Paul, were big fans of the faces. John hated them, he liked Bands of Grass Generator. I think all of us liked a bit of Tamla Motown, and then we were hip to things like Jonathan Richmond before he'd come out. Um, it's it's all in there in the mix somehow, and mm. it just came out. It came out. We knew exactly what we didn't want to sound like, but we was going to do it anyway, and it came out like that. You know, and I think you know by the time they went into making the album, everybody become pretty good players. You know, and my yardstick is always a a simple thing done well, and I think that's probably the case yeah. with Stephen Paul. And then you had Rotten's fantastic presence on top of that. So, um, mm. yeah, 
And a, a very, very, very difficult question to answer, in my opinion. Maybe it isn't for you because I thought about it and I really couldn't come up with an answer. Is have you got a favourite track from that album? Well, I'm probably biased. I like Pretty Vacant because I was the bloke what wrote it in Bastoni Way's fashion. Um, but I also think it's important because it was really the first. It's kind of funny. It's probably one of the first songs I ever wrote. And I'm still playing it now. But, and it's not bad. It's a good one. But I think it's important because it was written before Anarchy and God Save the Queen, which was originally called No Future. Um, and it was a bit of a template of a song about something that's not, you know, a love song or something like that. It was a bit of a manifesto, which Malcolm was always going on. You guys should write a manifesto. You know, actually write, because he was into all the 60s art movements and the... The other guard in Paris and the Situationists and all that and that and um, who you know the surrealists wrote a manifesto of what they're going to do while they're sitting around drinking absinthe you know never wrote an, a, a manifesto but I wrote it played into writing the lyrics of the song you know and then John yeah. come up with Anarchy in the UK which is a well he came up with the words for that and I came up with the music for it it was um Sort, sort of a musical manifesto. Yeah, so hmm. I think it's a yeah. I, like, I, like, I like Anarchy in the UK. That's, that's pretty good. You know, it's a good toe tap, topical toe tapper. It is a good toe tapper for sure. Yeah. No, I was, I was walking down the road the other day with you coming on. I've been listening, obviously, to your solo stuff, which we're going to come on to, consequences coming and so forth. Um, but yeah, I was walking down the road listening to Nevermind the Bollocks and it's like, oh yeah, that was my favourite. No, hang on that one. No, hang on that one. All the way home. So I couldn't make my mind up. And one one other question on this, because I say I want to get onto your current work, because that's what's important. Um, 50th anniversary of that album will be coming up in a couple of years. Would there be another reunion tour or is that over and done now? This looks like it's over and done, maybe. But who yeah. knows? The black magic box. And also, where do you measure? <laughs> no, where do you measure fifty years from? Hey, eh? where do you measure fifty years from? From the release date of the album. Oh, okay. Right. Um, Why? Well, I just wondered. You know, there's loads of people that are first gig members. The songs first written. Oh no! I was thinking like the the when the album came out from that day because being such a massive album, but Fair enough. never say yeah. never. Never say never, but don't hold your. But back. we need to. But we need we need to move on to the here and now. So obviously the the Blondie connection because obviously that's your next big thing coming up. That started when was it back? I I heard somewhere it was they came down to see you when you did the Vicious White Kids gig. Is oh, that yeah, right? I that's when I first met them. I think I'd seen them play at Thing Wars or, or somewhere like that. Then I did 78, I did um, a one off gig with Sid, the Vicious White Kids at Electric Ballroom. And as I remember it, Blondie were there. Um, and they, they, I thought they were quite sweet, you know, because they'd obviously had a night off and they all came down as a band. I mean, there was loads of people there, but. Um, I think, I think that's when I met Clem, you know, we started hanging out a little bit and became mates and we've done loads of playing over the years and stuff. And then you, you go out, when I was playing with Iggy Pop in 79, I was in New York quite a lot. And as I remember it, we played the Palladium on Halloween with the Cramp supporting us. The whole audience was in fancy dress gear. And backstage, oh, wow. Debbie, Debbie Harry dressed as a witch who gave me a kiss on the cheek. It was kind of quite nice. My first oh, time ever. Wow. Whether that's true or not, I, 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 that's how I remember it, and that's how I like to remember it. It was a long time ago. I was going to say, how how hazy are your memories from those days? <laughs> certain things you like to remember, and certain things you can't remember. But there's normally a reason behind that. But the, the point that's is, I've known, I've known them all a little bit for a long time. But Clem, I've been mates with her for a long time, and two years ago now they. It wasn't working out with their bass player. I don't know why. Lee Fox, he's a really nice guy. Um, and he's a great bass player. But they, it weren't working out. And Clem called me up. And um, he said, 
you know, it's not working out with Lee. You, you know, do you fancy being our bass player for a bit? And I went, well, you know, when you think in a couple of months, he said, no, next week. And I was like, whoa. I oh. said, let, let, me, let me think about it. And I had to make some plans to get a work permit sorted out, which I did the next day. And not that I got one immediately. But anyway, I went over there and now I'm playing with Blondie. So, yeah, it's yeah. good. Great body of work. They're all great. Debbie's fantastic. I love playing with Clem. In fact, when earlier this year, in, in the January, February, I was touring with my thing in California. We did half a dozen shows and Clem helped me put a band together with him on drums and Gilby Clark and this bass player called Steve Fishman who's a mate over there. Um, it's a good little unit, you know, so. Yeah, I was I was just, you, you, well done, because you just preempted me, because I was talking about Blondie, and I was just going to say for everyone that's watching, so um, Glenn is off with Blondie very, very soon, and the dates that I've got down in Australia is the 20th of this month is Melbourne, the 25th is Sydney, and the 27th is the Gold Coast, and right. you've got my... One of my favourites, Alice Cooper on the bill with you. He's who I always go and see. And you're coming on his tour for two dates in October as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm opening it up for him on um, at Hammersmith Odeon. Um, see, you've made my decision because whenever Alice comes over here, I always go. And I said, what date shall I go to? What dates? And it's like, oh, Glenn's doing the London one. So that's made my decision. I'll come down and see both of you on the same night. That'll be fantastic. Cool. We'll come for both nights, yeah. No, I no. could do, couldn't I? Come and stay over. I like you that know. idea. So, yes. Sorry, carry I'm, on. I'll wear a different shirt the next time, you know. Will you? Oh, you see, now I have to come because I have to check on that. Yeah. <laughs> Are you bringing off underpants, though, to change? <laughs> so, anyway, so we're talking about present times at the moment. So, Blondie Pandemonium Tour, Australia, a couple of weeks. And then you were just, again, you preempted me. You've got another band, Glenn Matlock and the Maestros, and that's Clem. Maestros is Clem and Gilby and Steve in America. Yeah. Over here is Chris Musto, Neil X from ZZ Sputnik, and Jim Lowe, who's a mate of mine, is help. He's a record producer. He's done a lot of the stereophonic stuff. He's even got a Grammy for doing a jazz album with with uh, Jeff Beck and Billy Cobham or something like that. He plays bass. I have different bands because you can't afford to get work permits and fly everybody and put them up all the time everywhere, you know. So it's mm. simple. They all play as good as each other, but differently, but they're in keeping. We can't agree on a name for the English band. In fact, I almost called it Full English for the last two. It's, well, it's not bad, but the only thing is Neil couldn't do a gig because he plays with Mark Armand as well. And I had to get a dep in for the show in Nottingham. And we got this guy, Ray Mead, who's actually plays guitar, but he's also plays bass with Ocean Calisine. And he came and did it. But the thing is, he's Glaswegian. So if I'd called a band Phil English, I would have been fibbing. Ah. You can't have that, you know. No, so, that's not going to so, work then, is it? Suggestions are welcome. I did call the band the Philistines before, but I kind of moved on from that. And I like the name the Philistines because I, years ago, I've always been a big fan of Ian Dury and the Blockheads, and I wanted a name a bit like that. And I thought by now, you know, predicts in the future, here comes the future, and the, <laughs> on the, the calendar keep going like that, and the wheels go back. Yeah, yeah. No, I've had so many hits I could put out best of album, and I could call it Completer Up. Complete and utter philistines, right? But it didn't work out. Like no, <laughs> I just saw, I just saw a quest thing come up on screen there from somebody I know. Uh, said, "Why don't you stop by on Fremont Street and play, play on one of those stages?" Because I go to Vegas a lot, and I keep missing you because you seem to go there a lot, and we seem to cross over. So yeah, what about doing a uh, getting yourself on one of those big stages down on Fremont Street and tying into that? I want to know about the Punk Rock Museum because I was debating on my last trip going down there and I didn't, but you did one of the little walk around tours there. Is it worth a visit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a cool place. Um, I, I was a little bit hamstrung by the fact that it's mainly American stuff, but I learned quite a lot from it. They've only been going a year. They're trying to get more stuff. The people there are cool. Um, 
Yeah, why not? But also, it's next to, I think, what they call in America, and don't take this the wrong way, but you've been around a little bit, a titty bar, right? And it's got oh, this, yes. It's got, this pro, it's got this proper sign outside. I didn't go in it. It's got the sign outside. It says, hundreds of beautiful hot girls and three ugly ones. And it's on the official sign. <laughs> 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 If you're looking for the punk rock museum, if you see that, it's just to the right of it. <laughs> Marvellous. Well, I can't miss it, can I? <laughs> and I also played there the week before with um, Clem. We, did, uh, we played at the Virgin Hotel, which used to be the Hard Rock Hotel. But Hard even, Rock, yeah. You even had my, my name and picture and lights on the corner of the building in Las Vegas. And they're quite a good time so i was pretty busy there and then i also did another thing at the end of that before then i went and played with my mate slim jim phantom at a buddy holly convention in iowa wow. and um it was the place where he did his very ever last show in this fantastic old ballroom it's called the surf ballroom in clear lake iowa and it used to be a roller skating rink and it was full of sort of 70 year old bobby socks and all their 50s kind of gear it was great and it, it wasn't just oh, us it was, like... it was, it was, it was, it was the whole weekend we played one weekend and i got up with slim jim but also he did like an all-star jam thing and um who was playing uh chris montez was playing so i'm up on stage with chris montez doing let's dance and la Bamba and all that it was great it was fun and then i went to the punk rock museum yeah um, I've been a busy boy. It, you you are a ridiculously busy boy. So we were we were actually watching um, Head on a Stick earlier. Oh, okay. I like that. Before one. you came on, because anyway, again, for people watching that don't know, we're talking about all the people and all the things that Glenn's done. But what Glenn is extremely good at is his solo stuff. And I think it's six LPs you've had out now. But the most recent was Consequences Coming. And the single and the video was uh, Head on a Stick which yeah, uh, I absolutely loved it. It's one of those songs, once it's in there, it will not go out of my head. Well, good. The only thing is, I kind of was hoping I'd get a bit more play on Radio 1 or something, but it's, it's a little bit too airy lyrically for them, you know, and mm. they all kind of liked it, but I am the start as all is to not be too critical of the powers that be, which I like to think that yeah. the song is, you know. But I think in a year that's gone by since that come out, the album come out about this time last year and the single came out at the end of last January. Um, I think the wheels have turned a little bit more and I think there's a bit of a sea change. I don't know what your politics are, but I know what my, um, mine are. And I think a lot of people have been but taking them for a long ride in this country and they're wise enough to find them. Things yeah. haven't been going very well for quite a long time. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and and in in the um in the spirit of head on a stick it's all very vlad the impaler is there anyone uh in particular you'd put to the top of that list farage reese mob um trump um cameron may all the charmers basically you know and i'm um, not particularly pro labor but i'm not particularly well i'm not particularly pro Starmer, but I'm so I'm vehemently against the people mm. who hoodwinked to the populace, you know. So there you go, and it's a metaphorical thing. But I did send yeah. when the track when the track came out. You know the bloke who's always in Parliament Square with the loud halo. Oh, speaking. he keeps saying the shouting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he does a bit more. He's he's like a thorn in their side. I like to think. Yes. Anyway, I sent him. A copy of it and him and his missus made up pictures of the tories with on sticks <laughs> and went to no. bed it's, it's online somewhere playing head on a stick and he's he's parading up and down outside down his street with it so oh um, that is brilliant <laughs> That is superb. And going because we want to, I want to keep reminding people about Glenn's solo work because I don't think it's getting enough coverage, and it should do. Going back to your other, one of your other albums, the Good to Go album. Yeah. What about it? And um, 
keep on pushing. I saw a yeah. review and I totally, totally uh, listen to this, everybody. The review said that it was the best song ever in the history of the universe. Keep on pushing. And that was um, Sirius XM. Oh, right. Yeah. That, yeah. They played it. But do you know that what? is an, a, a, such a good track? There's some amazing lines in there. My one is golden years is what we're told. Golden yeah. years. But where's the gold? I love that line. Exactly. But do you know what? Going back to what we were talking about earlier, do you know yeah, yeah. who the lead guitarist on that is? No. The lead guitarist from the Wombles. Oh, Chris he's Bird. back again. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep all your connections going all these years, don't you? <laughs> you repeat when you get on with people. And what happened with that song? I wrote it, the chord sequence and all that. And I thought, you need them. We put the rhythm track down. And sometimes I learned this from me and Unser was talking to. What he used to do is we'd do all the recordings and have half an idea and just put the tape on. And yeah. as you're doing a sandwich or making a cup of tea or going about your business, it's playing over and over and it gives you more ideas to finish off the lyrics, you know, and what you're talking about. But when I was doing it with that song, I'd be done the rhythm track. I thought it needs something else. And I picked up the guitar and I'm playing along and I sort of came up with this riff that was kind of not a nick from but it was kind of there was a picking thing down 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 i thought it reminds me of something what's it remind me of oh it reminds me of the price of love which is an everly brothers song but there's a version by by brian furry who's a guitarist on that lead guitarist of the wombles so i called up chris i said what are you doing tomorrow do you want to come down the street? He said, well, so I've got a track where you play this on it. It's a bit like Price of Love kind of thing. And he did it. And it was kind of cool. And then, oh, said, what, do you want, what do you want for doing it? He said, well, you played bass on a couple of my things, so let's call it quips. So there you go. Nice. And do you still, are you still in contact with um, Rusty and Midge from your days in uh, Rich Kids? Um, Midge, not so much because he doesn't live in town. I think he lives in Portugal now, actually. I mean, we haven't fallen out or anything, but um, every once in a blue moon, I'll put something up online and he'll like it, and vice versa. Rusty, I see out and about a bit more. I love Rusty, yeah. he's the only drummer I know that can hit the drum once, and you know it's him just by the sound of him hitting the drum. Is it? And he has all this DJ and stuff and all that. Good luck to him, but he's a really he's, a, he's another very he's very a, busy boy, Rusty. Yeah, he don't drum enough, and he he could be a world class drummer if he kept it up, and he don't. So yeah, but he's uh, yeah he's somebody I think we should have on here. I keep thinking about who we're going to have on next, and I think he's on my list for sure, for uh -huh. sure. Oh, I know something I was going to ask you. Do you think do you think Rusty Egan should come on this show, Glenn? Yeah, why not? Thank you. You'd have, um, you'd, have to, you'd have to have an override button though, because he will rub it. I was told that. Now, who was it? I'm trying to think. Somebody else that's worked with him, and we talked about having him on before. And I was, I was warned about that. Oh, question. Going back to Clem Burke. Yeah. I've heard you say in the past that when you go over there, you stay at his house, and when he comes over here, he stays at your house. Who's the yeah. better house guest? Well, I like to think we've got quite a symbiotic house guest kind of thing. I give him the keys. He gives me the keys. We keep ourselves to ourselves. And not hide from each other. Yeah, we rub along all right, you know. I mean, basically, I think what you want in a house guest is that you can trust them to not nick nothing. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, that is quite important. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I've just noticed, I've just noticed our time and I'm, going mental now because i had so many things i still want to say have you got a teeny bit longer to stay with us go on go on then go on. right okay brilliant thank you thank you thank you um oh right at the beginning i said about you acting in that um what was it it was the paddy lincoln gang it was a yes. docudrama it was in the paddy lincoln gang um how did how did it come about and have you got any other aspirations for doing more acting um right it came about because the guy, when I was playing a bit, little bit with a version of the faces with Ronnie Wood and Kenny Jones and Emma Glaggan, Rod didn't do it, but McUpmore did it and he was very good. 
The guy who was involved in that called David Bainbridge, who is sadly no longer with us, he was involved with making this movie. And mm -hmm. that bit where the guy who's the main guy who goes around bumping off all the people in his band, right, a bit weird, um, because he thinks they're all having the scene with his girlfriend behind his back, something like that. He approaches an aging rock and roller for some advice. All right. And it's not apparent that he's bumped everybody off as yet. And they asked me to play the Asian rock and roll. And now, considering that was about 12 years ago, I thought it was a blinking cheek. But I thought, when else? Yeah, bloody cheek. <laughs> and because we was about to do a Faces gig, they did a thing earlier on the day, earlier on in the day at the side of the stage, because it was all set up that it looked like it was going to be a gig. They asked me to do it, and we had to kind of. Um, What's the word? We had to, there was no script. We had to just kind of make yeah. it up. We went along. It. Improvise, wing it. And I was getting into it and they went, great. I said, should we do it properly now? And I said, no, Glenn, that's fine. And I wanted to do a bit more acting. But that, that was it. And it came out. And when I went to see the movie, I found out that at the end, just through chatting to the bloke, it wasn't really clear. And the movie was all right, but it weren't great. But he didn't actually bump off the band. It was all a dream. Right. Oh, Matt, like, will you play you know, Sherlock or something like that? I go, all right, my boy, yeah, possibly I will. I was going to say, if there was, if there was a, a, a film role that you could be offered that you think you would suit perfectly, what would it be? Who would I you like, want to play? I like to think, right, that, right, when we was turning with the pistols one time, we were just, you know, a bit, sort of um passing the time when you've done a lot of travel traveling we was sort of joking it as carry on pistols you know and that we could all be different characters out of the things paul went i'll be sir james and it's kind of funny because he does look a bit like him these days you know and rotten could be kenneth williams steve we thought could be bernard breslau and i thought i could be jim dow who was in the latter movies and stuff so mm -hmm. i quite like to be a jim dow kind of character you know I can see that. Maybe. Yeah. But really, really, what I'd like to be in, in America, say, is I, I could be the new Dudley Moore, except I'm probably older than Dudley when he passed away already now, so it's a bit late for that. But you never know. You, know, you never pain. know. Like I say, you don't know what's... You, I think you're the sort of person that would always say you'll give it a go. Whatever comes your way, you'll give it a go. Yeah, give it a go. You know, you just never know what's coming next. So one other thing, a couple of things I was going to ask you, hobbies or things that people might not know about you. So when, when I had, you know, Paul Gray, the yeah. damned, yeah. when he was on and we were chatting, one of the things we really got, got into was plants and vegetables. And he's very big on growing his vegetables. And well, now if I have a... If I have a veggie like issue, like I wanted to know where I should best put my spuds this year, I contact him and say, right, Paul, give me some advice. So oh. what is your area of expertise? If I went, oh, I'm stuck with doing this, I know, I'll ask Glenn, what's he an expert in? It's probably coffee shops and made of out. <laughs> <laughs> so if I've got a plumbing issue or uh, putting a shelf up, there's no good calling you. <laughs> Well, well, I can tell you now, good advice, don't call me. You know that whole ad age is measure twice, cut once. I do all of that, and it still comes out wonky. Best thing to do is get a bloke in. You know, where's the bloke? There he comes now, right? Might be a bit late, but he's going to do a proper job. And you can sit the other side of the room with a cup of coffee or loiter outside the front doors with a cigarette, watching him, tell him where he's gone wrong. Now, I'm very good at that, right? Yeah. And the is I was talking to a friend of mine this girl jane ashley um and um we were talking about ambition and she said well do you think you've got anything i said well to be honest i think i've achieved my ambition and she said well what's that i said well i like sitting outside coffee uh, cafes with a coffee and a cigarette watching the world go by and i'm very good at it and i can do it at any continent in the world i can do that so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of all achievers. Do you know what? It's a skill, Glenn. It's, it's a skill. And I think you've honed it perfectly. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't want to, you know, sing my own praises too much. But I think I'm jolly good at it. 
you know, some yeah. people that's why they look a bit timid and don't look like they they be they belong there. And I look mm. like I own the fucking place, right? Yeah, no. you just you you you're the man. So that yeah. has to bring you on to yeah, it has to bring you on to the favourite question that we always have on this program, and you've led into it beautifully. Tea and biscuits. I always ask my guests, what is their favourite biscuit? Do they have tea or coffee, and do they dunk? Right. Well, okay. There's a bit of a a conflict going in there because oh. I, I I am a big fan of Gary Baldy, right? You know the dead fly biscuits, mm -hmm. which are pretty good dunked in the tea. But I'd hardly drink tea, but they're not very good dunked in coffee. They might be all right dunked in a Nescaf, but a proper cappuccino, it, it, they, the two of them don't go together. Mm -hmm. Right now, also going back to Clemstown here, his mates were the Debbie and Andy from Bootleg Blondie, and they come round. Oh yeah, and I like him. But, Sometimes you don't want people around your house all the time. But they always bring a peace offering, which is a packet or two of Gary Baldy biscuits. Now, the thing with a Gary Baldy is, is you have to break them off yourself. And it's never a break. So you got to have another one. Boom, that rose gone. Gary Baldy, a bit my downfall kind of thing. Tea. Uh, Gary Baldy's. Tea. Tea. Not coffee, right? For for the Dunkin'. Okay, all right. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll definitely remember that. That's, you're the first one to come up with Garibaldi's. Excellent. And moving on from that as well. Say you're at a gig. We're in, we're in the food and drink area now. You're at a gig. What would you always want to have on your rider backstage? Um, I, I don't have much of a rider. Some fresh coffee. No. Some biscuits, cheese and onion sandwich, packet of cheese and onion crisps. Busy water. That's it. I'm not a lot. I don't drink these days, so I don't need that. Um, that's it. If I'm doing solo shows, which I do quite a few acoustic shows every now and then, mm. I always ask my local paper, and then you got something to talk about. I don't always read it, but sometimes there's a headline or you flip through, and then you go, "How oh, about Mrs. Brown? All that trouble going on with the washing machine and the laundrette, and then that bloke." From the council who came in. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I learned that. I went to the Isle of Wight Festival when the Rolling Stones were playing. Mick Jagger. Yeah. Came and you know, it was so funny. He said, Do you know what? He said, People don't believe this. You know, Mick, <laughs> Keith Richards is tuning up his guitar or something like that. He said, I had a wander around the site last night. He said, those bottles of water, the price of them, would you believe it? That £2.50 for a small bottle of water. Mick Jagger's saying this, and everybody's going, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, all right, you're making me laugh, so that's something I was going to ask you as well. Although you said right at the beginning of the Hancock post, I was going to ask you, what makes you laugh? Ooh, what makes me mm. laugh? Um... Oh, that's a that's a hard one to pin down, isn't it? I, I I like the kind of use of language. I'm not. I'm sort of renowned for not being that big on swearing, and I like to save up my swearing um, for when it really matters. And then, yeah, my dad said to me once. He said he was in the air force when he was called up national service, and he said they had a sergeant major, and he ticked off some bloke. You know, he was swearing all the time. And the sergeant major said, oh, what do you have the, the, the um, RAF equivalent? And he said, you know what, mate? He said, if you stop swearing, you'd have nothing to say. <laughs> and I, that's always stuck with me, that. So I like to not swear until it really, really matters. But I think people constantly swearing is a bit lame. But in the right yeah. hand, it can be big and clever. You know, in the right hand. Right. So you've got I to think, pick yeah. your, your moment with things. Uh, I think, yeah, it's got more impact, isn't it? There are people who use it almost like punctuation. It's every other word, and then you almost don't hear it. Whereas if you're somebody who doesn't say it very often, it's very explosive and noticeable if you come out with it. Yeah, that's that's where I'm coming from. So Yeah, you know, I think I think you're right. Yeah, so save it up a little bit. But comedy, um, I don't know, I'm, I suppose I'm getting older and a bit old school. A lot of things, you say... 
you kind of shocked me earlier on. You said there's lots on the telly. There's nothing on the telly I ever want, want to watch. Oh, that, damn it. I was going to ask you if you had anything to recommend. <laughs> no. I, I, you know, I like old sort of arty movies and historical things. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Galton and Simpson and people like that, where the writing is is kind of really good you know occasionally something's on and maybe i don't give things a lot of chance just because the way they kind of look really mm. the things you know i've got disney plus and i've got hulu and i got that and i flip through and i can never find nothing i like that um bruce springsteen's song is it 57 channels and nothing on them or whatever it is yeah, channel hop. You can spend about 20 minutes. You think, I haven't actually watched anything. I've watched about five seconds of this, 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 and got bored of all of it. Oh, yeah. someone said he's going to start. Michael's going to try and stop cursing as much, but he can't promise. All right. Fair, fair enough, Michael. Now, listen, I did have a whole load of viewers' questions that I was going to throw at you, but with the way the time's going, I think people are going to want to kill me because. If you, if you want to read out a couple. Can I? Are you sure? Are you sure? There's not that many. There's literally a couple. But I'll probably get shot if I don't ask them. So I'll fire at them really quickly. <clears throat> if you could pick your ultimate band lineup, who would it be and why? Ian wants to know. Oh. Well, do you, do you know what? I, I don't know that that's a straightforward question because it all depends what you're doing. Music. True. You know, if, are you trying to do a whole bunch of big ballads? Yeah, in fact, which I like to do when I have a go at singing the Anthony Newley catalogue. And then, then you'd have to have the Royal Philip Monarch Orchestra or something like that, or the John yeah. Barry band doing it. You know, if you want to play Iggy Pop stuff, you need sort of somebody who's played with him and, you know, a bit mm. of a stupid influence. Or if you want to play Faces style, sort of pop, rocky soul stuff, with a bit of the meters and the temptation phone, then you want Ronnie Wood, who's my favorite guitarist, really. But I play mm. with people and they're all good. I'm being a bit diplomatic here now, but you know, all right. when you people get, when people get to a certain stage of playing, you can't really say they're better or worse than somebody else because they kind of play like their personality. I had this old Ravel. Slick, you know, and we was doing some stuff and he plays on my Good To Go album and he plays on the new one as well. And, you know, in the studio and he's sort of making up bits going along and I say, no, look, come in on the one. And he'll go, no. And he said, you always want to come in on the one and I want to come in on the one end or the two. And I said to him, that's only because you've got no idea of what you're going to be about to do and you're, it gives you a bit of extra time thinking about it. And he went, well, that's true. <laughs> Sussed him out. <laughs> Oh well, yeah, that is a, that is. To be fair, that is a difficult question because it does very much depend on what you're doing. All right, let me throw throw another quick one at you. James had two quick questions. One is, how do you keep a balance between home, family life, and touring? And the other one was that you're in fantastic shape. What do you do in terms of diet and exercise to stay looking as good as you do? Um, well, thank you. I don't know that I'm in such fantastic shape. I don't. You know, this whole thing with the Gary Baldy biscuits. It's a it's yeah, well. I, I, I won't actually buy them for myself. I'm not being tight, but if they're in the cupboard, I'll eat them. No, I don't. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll, I like a bit of dark chocolate, but I'll only buy one of those little tiny bars, you know, like green and blacks kind of thing. Or something oh, like they're that. nice. Big bar, you go for it. Cheese. If I go to Marks or somewhere like that, I buy a small bit because I know I'll scoff the lot. So I'll just get a little bit, you know. It's, it's, I think the thing is, is keeping out of harm's way. I like to walk and swim when the weather's warmer. Um, yeah. And that's kind of it, really. I don't know. Just don't. So you don't any do anything like going to the gym or running or any yoga or anything like that? I, I do do Pilates once in a blue moon. But it's, it's hard to, you know, I'm traveling so much all the time. It's hard to, have a regular routine and then when I do yeah. get back back and you know I've done three tours this this year already and it's so much traveling. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh getting on a little bit. Yeah. You know. Um you just want to uh, go and sit in that coffee shop with your fag watching the world go by. Yeah. Basically. 
sounds reasonable sounds perfectly yeah. reasonable to me right two other, two other quick ones i'm going to throw at you okay it's quite long-winded but hopefully the answer will be short uh the sex pistols initial success was short-lived did you realize the band would become one of the most influential and important acts in popular music history did you realize the genuine gravitas of the band or were you all too busy being off your tits to notice that comes from Anne. right all right Anne. um we wasn't all off our tits all the time at the beginning that came a bit later in fact it probably came in the aftermath of the pistols um I don't know, it's, it's two things kind of contradict each other. Mm. Um, I don't think we ever really saw past the end of the week. I didn't. But we always thought we had something pretty good that was head and shoulders above everybody else. And we was in the right place at the right time with the right attitude and the right people surrounding us, Malcolm and Vivian. Mm. And it didn't form us, but we kind of used them as much as they used us i think and all those things kind of came came together yes we had this top show arrogance be everybody in the band was right at the right time to do the right thing mm. and people picked up on it but we were in a period where people were looking for some kind of change and we came through yeah everything blazing the fashion the music the lyrical stance the artwork you know the 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 scene, um, and it yeah. all came through. And it's very hard, you know, when you've been in other bands after that. You can't manufacture that. It's a product of its time, and it, it's just if you got a gut reaction, you might be in on that. You just got to go yeah. with it, really. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, and, and another. I think that answers it. I think that does. Her other one was um, there's Anne again of the current acts that are around. Yeah. Who, who do you rate? She says she's thinking about the likes of Young Blood. Do you think acts like him are where it's at, or are they copycats with no fresh ideas? Um, well, I've met and like Young Blood as a bloke. He's all right. I'm not, oh, you bet him. Okay. Well, my sons are playing bands, um, and they sort of on the scene. In fact, my younger son used to work in a guitar shop with Young Blood down Denmark Street. So it's kind of, I'll tell you, I did see, I thought it was good. I, I don't go and see that many bands because I'm touring. If I go and see bands, I'll see people who I know. Um, I did go and see Frank Carter at the Roundhouse. So that was kind of, he was good. All right. I liked him. Um, I liked a bit, bit of nepotism. My older boys in a band called Wargasm, and they're doing pretty well. They've got something going. Orgasm. Himself. Yeah, it's a great name. Right. That is a good name. I like that name. What else have I seen? I don't know. Hmm. Don't know, really. I'm looking forward to seeing Alice Cooper when we do some shows with him. Yeah. Have you ever worked with him before or not? No, but I met him once in Anaheim. Very briefly, I got a picture of me and Clem and Gilby Clark and some other people. With Alice Cooper, I went to see him. Um, yeah, no, so that should be quite kind of interesting. Um, but, uh, I'm not working. Well, yeah, it's only a couple, couple of months apart, isn't it? So you're working down there with him, Australia in April, and then over here in October, tw twice in yeah, one year. You staying on the same boat, boat bill, don't mean you're working with somebody, but you know, you probably bump into them. Most people I've met in bands, you know, they're pretty kind of cool, but they're getting on with doing their, getting on yeah. with what they're kind of thing you know which is what i must let you do because I'm, I'm a terrible person i have overrun enormously and i'm super grateful to you for hanging in there and uh, sticking with us Thanks, when you Adam. should be sitting in a sitting in a coffee shop having a fag in the sunshine because i don't know about where you are but it's nice and sunny here so we are currently scrolling glenn's socials across the bottom of the screen so if you want to find out what he's up to if you want to get in touch with him everything all the details are there and then when you finish the show if you look at the show notes at the bottom all of the links to all of glenn's socials are in there so you'll probably get bombarded with uh, facebook and instagram and what's your preferred method if people contact you what's the one you go on the most post <laughs> no i don't i don't i don't i don't i don't all equally really you know in fact i said I, when i was playing with biggie pop 
and then I wasn't playing with Megan Pop. It was my choice, but I went to see him play and I'd had a bit of a drink. I said, we should still do something, you know, like write and all that. And I had a bit too much to drink. And Bowie was there in a the dressing room with a music machine. And he looked at me and I was like, hey, it's, uh, I said, he said, yeah. We should go. I said, how, how should we go about doing it? He said, hey, let's do it by post and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> For for the younger viewers, post is the scene where you used to write words on bits of paper and put them in envelopes, just for the ones under 20 who've never heard of it. <laughs> anyway, Glenn, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time today. We are going to wrap things up. If we can say farewell to you and just pop you backstage for a moment. Any final words of wisdom to the, to the watching public? Um, don't do what I wouldn't do. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Glenn. We'll pop you backstage. We'll be back to you in just one minute. And thanks for being on Reignite today. Okay. So there we go, gang. That wraps it up. Sorry, we overran a lot. Tried to fit in as much as we could. If I missed anything, I apologise. But uh, what a fantastic guest. Thank you all for joining us. We do have other guests lined up, but not saying anything yet. So you better subscribe and uh, then you'll know who's coming next. So thanks for tuning in. Bye bye all for now. <laughs>